Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and my absolute privilege to introduce the next speaker who has, among many other people, saved, single-handedly saved my life. It is one of my absolute superheroes, Dr. Mike Kuznir! <laughs> No, with that introduction, I'm telling you, this is, uh, let me see. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm getting more nervous than Marisol. Uh, there we go. Um, so so we're, we're going to be talking over the next 45 minutes on uh, next generation sequencing liquid biopsies. This is a lecture that it's a lot to cover in 45 minutes. So even though that I usually get most of the times like 20 to 25 minutes in, in uh, most of the uh, big events, this one we got a little bit of a longer time and it still is probably gonna be short for what we need to cover. And the reason is, as it, as it was said here by uh, Herbert Spencer, which was a not so nice guy, but a very prominent uh, sociologist and um, probably a philosopher, you can even call him from the 1800s, a big competition of Darwin. He used to say that civilization is a progress from indefinite in current homogeneity towards a definite current heterogeneity. That's exactly where we're going. So what I'm intending to do is, as it says below that, if I am not going to convince you, at least I'm going to confuse you. <laughs> so. Where are we in oncology? Oncology, it's actually very, very young. Believe it or not, when you look at oncology and you compare oncology to infectious disease, this is a picture of uh, what it was called the martyrdom of mercury, in which in the 1800s and even before that, they used to say, a night in Venus, a lifetime in mercury, meaning one night of Venus, con then getting syphilis and being treated with mercury for the rest of your life, which is a heavy metal and end up killing the patients with the mercury later on. That was actually the, the treatment that we had for most of the infectious disease, mercury, arsenic. Compare that to what we, it was oncology when I trained and even now, that what are we using? Heavy metals, platinum, similar to mercury. Arsenic, we still use. We still use arsenic for some of our leukemia. So it's we're not that far away. And the truth is that that's kind of like what it starts to get us into some of the targeted therapies. When we started looking at the different cellular pathways, we realized that, okay, this is not that difficult. And I remember when I was um, in training, we had a drug at that time in development that ended up being shelved, that it was a matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor for the ones that know a little bit of history of oncology. And I had the only patient that was responding in the whole world, and the company that was making it, they said like, okay, all the stockpile of that drug, because we're shelving it, is your patient. When it's done, the patient is done. The patient had a, tu a tumor that it was an adenocystic carcinoma that was deemed for failure with everything else, and the patient was an analyst for the IRS and a mathematician in training and started looking at these pathways and said like, okay, I know that my tumor may have this pathway because of what it was known in the late 90s. If we block that pathway and this other pathway, maybe we can get also that way similar to what we're getting with the matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor and started devising some mathematical models. Lo and behold, obviously this pathway is nothing to what we are seeing, and this is just of colorectal cancer, to put it as an example, how the different lines start to become really convoluted and reverberant and much more complex that when you compare them to the previous slide, that it's kind of like a very linear type of thing, here starting to connect all the different levels. And the best example that you have to realize how difficult is that is if I tell anyone, like, let's block the subway in Tokyo. And if you take the Tokyo-based subway system and I tell you like, okay, I want you to block the subway, but you can only block every line, but every time that you block one line, then the subsequent lines that are next to that one increase by five times the frequency. And if you block the next line, that one will increase by an additional five lines and the one that you had blocked will start connecting to a different pathway. And it's gonna make it very difficult if I put conditions, which is the way that the cells behave. The second problem when you start looking at the molecular biology is that we had it completely wrong from the time that we started to understand that. On the right, on the right of, of, of the slide, 
you have what it used to be called the Vogelgram. The Vogelgram was when Bert Vogelstein over at Hopkins devised the development of colorectal cancer, and he said it is a very organized fashion in which the cells will essentially have an APC mutation and become normal colonic mucosa to an inflamed mucosa, then develop a RAS mutation, that will become a pre-malignant polyp, then with the RAS mutation develop TP53 mutations and become malignant and start to get more, much more metastatic potential. You look at that pathway, it's even though that the screen is large, you cannot look all over, but you see that there is no wind pathway in that line that Bert Vogelstein had. And on the left, you have the real signaling of what is mutated in colorectal cancer. And you see that on the top um, left side of the, of the slide, when pathway is mutated in 90% of the cancers, of colorectal cancers, and RAS is barely at 60%. So we probably did not have it right, even though that everybody was proposing that Bird should have gotten even the Nobel Prize for, for this type of teaching. And I don't disagree. He actually is super, super smart, but we had it wrong. It's not truly what happened. So how do we take all this knowledge of starting to look at different um, pathways, cellular communication, and all that, and take it into, a, into the next level? So to show you again how new it is, 1977 is when the first uh, sequencing method was published. From there, the PCR technique was developed in 1984, which nowadays you, you know how long does it take to get a PCR? Everybody that has been getting COVID tested, as probably every single person in this room has been, it could be any, anything from an hour to a day, but extremely fast. Then in the 90s, we heard about the Human Genome Project. Unbelievable. They're planning to sequence the whole human genome. You're talking that they had sequenced previously the fruit fly genome, and it was 14,000 genes. Now they were embarking in getting 24,000 genes approximately. That is the human genome. That's when I met Francis Collins when I was in Baltimore, and he had a tiny grant to do that of $300 million just to sequence 24,000 genes. And they did it. They, convert, they competed with Craig Venter. They end up uh, getting all that, and they published all the next generation sequencing methods and continue to go to the Tumor Cancer Genome Atlas to start sequencing the different type of tumors and getting the first whole cancer genome sequence. And you keep moving and moving until we get, in 2016, somatic landscape from even circulating free tumor DNA of more than 15,000 patients and decreasing the cost of the whole human genome sequencing to $600. It's expected that next year probably it's going to be $100 to sequence the genome of a person on the spot. So you're talking 20 years from $300 million to $600, but the possibility of doing it much more for every single patient. Now, again, that's kind of like the way that it looked in history, and very much a rapid development, that we were even surprised. I remember that for us in the, in the 90s, when uh, Francis Collins went to give us a lecture there in Baltimore, and he said, like, it's actually 60 to 65% concordant, the fruit fly to the human. Who would have thought that we have so much in common in between the species and, and all that stuff? to be able to learn how the genes behave because that will help us also for drug development and all that. So it went from thinking that in treatment of patients with uh, any type of cancer, one size fits all to start to get a little bit more of a stratified um, model to get into a precision level. So it went from a population of patients that we used to call X type of cancer to look at the genes and each one match to their own treatment. But the truth is that it's not that simple because you really have to be finding the right patient at the right time with the right choice of drugs for the time that the patient is being treated. So that's where we're going to be talking. And the reason that I say that is because when you look at those type of profilings of right patient, right time, right sequence, it takes you a little bit of like, and I'm going to be talking of clinical things up and uh, in, in between the conference, like for instance, the discussion of BRAF mutations in colorectal cancer that we know that for advanced disease in second line, maybe blocking only two pathways instead of three might be sufficient. 
while in lung cancer, a single pathway blockage, it's more than enough. So that's sort of like really choosing right patient, right pathway, right time. Because we know that this may not work the same way if we treat the patients on an early stage. So that's sort of like starting the preamble. Now, what's the problem with all this? That we need to value the biomarkers much more. There's a big paradigm in thinking that biomarkers should have a huge value and it's currently not the case. If somebody finds a biomarker, that biomarker really, unless that you have a drug that targets the biomarker, the biomarker is not something that has such a high value and the companies are not rapid in looking at all this, but trying to get that benefit cost of what we're doing in medicine, it's where the research money is going to be coming. Now, where are we on targeted therapies on those levels? And I always tell the residents that targeted therapy is extremely old. Methothrexate was published in 1947, and it's an absolute target of the hydro dehydrofolate reductase inhibitor. It inhibits a single enzyme. The problem is that it, ex that it inhibits in every single cell of the body. So it's not useful to treat in a, in a setting of personalized medicine. But the true first steps of personalizing medicine came with the development of looking at the estrogen receptors. We were able to identify that the patients that had tumors that were dependent on the estrogen receptors were able to be treated specifically with what surgeons in the 1800s used to do by taking the, the female ovary out and dropping down the, the ovarian function. Then obviously, the HER2 data became super up on the news, and from there you could see how it has continued to develop, and on the down level of the, of the curve, not of the curve, but of the graph, you can see all the different um, developments in technology of next generation sequencing that we're going to be talking a little bit more um, over the next uh, 20 minutes. The problem is that even if we know all that, we're getting all the knowledge adopting the technologies even when it should be absolutely imperative that everybody does it, it's not occurring in, in, the, in the marketplace. The best proof of that is what happened with KRAS. KRAS was actually found to be the real marker for sensitivity or resistance, depending on what side you want to see it, for colorectal cancer for the EGFR inhibitors. So you have an upstream receptor that is the EGFR, the intermembrane uh, domain, and a mutation in the dimerization of that intermembrane domain is the one that is the actual target, not where the antibody binds, showing that if the patient has a mutation in that receptor, it's constitutively activated, and we're not going to be able to block it with something that is transmembrane. So, you look at that, and it's in 2008, 2009, that KRAS was fully published. We learned that it was not really expression of EGFR. We learned that it was really on metabolic pathways. And then you look at the number of patients that truly benefit from anti-EGFR therapy, and you see that 60% of the patients anti-EGFR would not be recommended. Or you can see it on the, on the flip side of the coin, 40% should have it. But when you look at that, and the number of patients that were being tested in the country over the decades and over the years, look at that, 2013, 2014, 2017, 10 years after it had been reported, not even 60% of the country, and this is here, United States, we're not talking of when I give lectures in South America, here in the United States, only 60% of the metastatic colorectal cancers were being tested. So this is completely inappropriate. We're talking that if we ourselves cannot get in, into the country to test as a as a whole, the patient population, and to weed out that 40% that should benefit from that drug, we are very far from all these nice things that the press was saying of precision medicine. We are really getting into personalized medicine, smart medicine, call it whatever you want. It's not going to get there. Okay? Now, let's get into the topic of next generation sequencing and personalized medicine. The second problem is that we're going to find tons of genes into the patient's body and tons of mutations. Not all mutations are created equal. And similar to what this truck shows, we're going to have 
different things that we're going to find on the tissues or peripheral blood of the patients that are going to be playing different roles. So it's very different if I'm looking at this drug and I know that, that I may have a driver, like for instance, HER2 tends to be a driver mutation in most cancers, but you're going to see that it doesn't behave always the same. Sometimes it takes a rest and it's not always the driver then you're going to have something that is going to be assisting around that driver to pull the tumor, pull the truck from there. A lot of redundant things that sometimes might work, sometimes may not, which are essentially the, the tires of the truck. And then a gazillion passengers. Who's the passenger that is doing nothing? What difference does it make to the truck to have eight cars on top of it or six cars? Nothing. The truck continues to go, but if the truck does not have a driver, it stops. If a lot of the wheels get blown up, which are the redundant, it stops. And then, let alone what it can happen on the front line of the truck, how it interacts with other things, of the barriers, checkpoints, whatever you want, which essentially is the stroma of where the tumor is living, which is the PDL1. So, you have a lot of different aspects of the genes that you're going to be analyzing them. And the holy grail of the, of the next part of the lecture is what's what? And who's going to benefit from what I'm finding? And the answer actually, and this is kind of like the easy part, is here. 8.9% to date of the patients have a targeted therapy that I'm going to be able to find out when I do all my next generation sequencing. However, 100% of the patient benefits because a lot of them may end up getting something that I know that I should not expose them to, a toxic agent, or that I find that 8.9% of the patients. So when I'm doing my next generation sequencing, the number of patients that I'm going to say like, oh, I found this mutation, I'm going to give you this drug, that's 8.9%. But the other 91% I'm going to tell them, I'm not going to give you this drug. That's as beneficial as giving the drug. Okay? So, that's the reason that I challenge when people say like, oh, it benefits very few of the patients. No, it benefits everybody. Because if I'm not giving the patients drugs that they don't need, it's a good thing. The ones that don't really get benefit is a lot of our sponsors of these type of lectures. Because for the pharmaceutical company, it becomes that every single cancer becomes a rare cancer. So in the past, when a company was developing a drug and they were looking in their eyes that they had lung cancer in mind, 170,000 patients per year in the United States that are going to get this drug, it's not on a, anymore 170,000 patients a year. It's going to be a 5% of 170,000 and you're going to start splitting that pie until it becomes a rare disease every single type of cancer. And guess what happens with rare disease? No profit. So research and development, when you're getting to that point, becomes challenging. However, continues to be something that works. Because like, for instance, let's start with a rare disease, which is what I presented yesterday in another lecture. Cholangiocarcinoma, considered to be a rare disease to begin with. Guess what? 14% of cholangiocarcinomas have mutations on the IDH1, which are drivers. So if I take that out of the cholangiocarcinoma, I can take 14% of those patients and have them to, to uh, express an IDH mutation, I'm going to be able to treat those. We already have FGFR2 approved for cholangiocarcinoma out of a clinical trial that we uh, participated at, at Sinai and an additional number of patients that we're getting. So it's benefiting the patients. It's just that we need to be able to do it all the time. So the way that I'm conceiving what is happening currently in medicine is going back onto the old, and I am a, one of those people that like history of medicine, in which you're looking at how we used to classify lymphoma. In the 1960s, lymphoma was classified by a pathologist looking at the microscope and saying, those cells look like, those cells look small, those cells look like they're organizing in a follicle, those cells are all diffuse. Meaningless for us in clinic. And the pathologist will be like, no, but this is a small lymphoma. Yes, but the patient is dying with a lymphoma that is super aggressive, and this one that is also a small lymphoma is chilling in the beach and doing nothing. So the pathologist and what we were looking in all, in all these type of tumors started to evolve and get back into the clinic and looking at how they behave until we get what? Molecular studies. 
double heat lymphomas, double mutation lymphomas, and a lot of these other things that make them behave completely different. Why? Because we're learning on that. Now back to solid tumors, which is the, is the interesting part. Uh, this is in Spanish from another lecture, I'm sorry, but gastric cancer. Gastric cancer, this is the current AJCC classification, similar to the one of lymphoma, that it looks, if it's forming glands, it's an areno. If it's forming tubules, it's a tubular carcinoma, the same as 1960 for lymphoma. And then somebody that was smarter said, like, maybe we should, diff we should make them into intestinal, diffuse, still not getting to the point of how they're behaving clinically. These tumors, they do have a slight difference and all that stuff. We still could have a tumor that is of the same pathologic category and behaving completely different. Why? Because they have different genetic expressions. And those genetic expressions are what is going to mediate even the targets that we could use for treatment. So if you look at the molecular subtypes and in gastric cancer, and my lecture is obviously heavily on GI malignancies, but that's kind of like just to illustrate because it happens in all the other places, you could see that there's one that it could be much more chromosomally unstable. There's one that is going to be mutated by Epstein-Barr. There's going to be a lot of different things, and even on the ones that are Epstein-Barr mutant uh, or positive, and not mutant, but positive, they could have some different type of expressions on genes in which each one of the colors is a different patient and a different gene, kind of like bars and um, different areas, and the hypermethylation of those genes and how they are expressed is what is going to end up mediating the behavior of those tumors, and at the end of the day, getting back, this is back to our old RAS pathway, that's the raw gene, that it's going to tell us that the somatic alterations are going to be the ones that will tell us how they behave, and maybe we can take the same type of cancers that we were just talking, that were a very specific type, and tell you not only that they may be Epstein bar, like for instance, on the on the top part there, or the microsatellite um, stable or unstable, and start deciding, okay, they are going to be having this type of behavior based on the subsequent expression of other genes. Does it help completely? Maybe. Because, like for instance, one of the things that we had in ASCO GI last year, I think, or, or the previous year, is that they updated that 21% of, of the gastric cancers had met amplification, one of the genes that we're looking there. So you're like, oh, this is phenomenal. Similar to what you just told us with cholangiocarcinoma, we are going to be able to take those 21% patients with gastric cancer and treat them with a MET inhibitor. Guess what? No. It was probably a passenger or redundant. It didn't do anything. So MET could be amplified, but the same way. So if MET is amplified, but, it, but it's a redundant type of, muta of amplification, which means that there's too many wheels on that truck, if I take the other wheels, I still have the other wheels, because it was just redundant. So that's what happened. And it did not work at all. It's been shelved already. But then, again, and I'm going to show a few clinical cases, when you look at what our eyes will show. You see that this is a patient that we had in, in our clinic that the pathologist reported adenocarcinoma with negative HER2, colon. And I asked him to do the, the, the HER2. I just said, because I'm just curious. I, I, I'm, I'm the type of person that my mom always used to say that when, when they, she told me one day for something that I was asking, she was like, you, don't you know that curiosity killed the cat? And I asked like, what did the cat want to know? So that's... That's what happens. So you end up getting then more molecular studies. This is from 2014 or 15. This is an um, old report. And in those molecular studies, you see that the most important genes down, BRAF, KRAS, and NRAS, that were the ones that are more important for colorectal cancer, were reported as non-mutated, and then some other ones with amplifications. But I continue with my curiosity and also look at the plasma of the patient. And in the plasma of the patient, you see there a uh, middle second line, ERBB2 amplification. That's equivalent to HER2. And I'm like, really? So could there be a HER2 amplification even though that my pathologist already told me that there is no HER2 amplification? So I called my pathologist and I said, do me a favor and do um, fish on that HER2. Absolutely positive. So the next generation sequencing of blood, not even the tissue, the tissue did not show initially until I requested to be much more into an in-depth analysis to try to get that. 
And you're like, perfect, so you found a driver mutation on this patient, you're able to treat him more aggressively, which we did, and then you say like, and it probably is the same as what it's in breast cancer, that you have all these new drugs, beautiful things, now that it's breast cancer month, we're gonna get tired of pink ribbons and all that stuff, we're, and get a, all our GI patients very upset that nobody pays attention to them, and uh, like, how come that there's pink ribbons and there's not, not a, some of the other things, and, I even tell them that I wrote to the congresswoman that tried to pass a, legis a legislation on breast cancer, and I said, like, you should, uh, this, this doesn't make me pro, and probably that's the reason that she never replied to me, because she had a mutation, and she ended up developing a breast cancer, and I said, like, don't forget that that mutation could also give you pancreatic. Your legislation should also, so I don't know if because I remind her that she can get pancreatic cancer, she never replied to my letter and did not change her legislation, but on the other hand, I made my point, uh, at least, um, and, but, when you look at breast cancer, all these anti-HER2 drugs are there and they all work regardless of when we give them and they could get HER2 attached to holy water and probably would have some benefit for the patients. In gastric cancer, I don't know if it projects well, but the squares that are surrounded by red, it means that it did not work. So that driver, that is always the driver for breast cancer, takes a rest in gastric cancer after first line. Now we know that TDX2, transosumab deruxotecan, does work also again in second line. So maybe the driver just needs a different type of hammer to be, to be taken down. But the one that really, really takes the full, full credit of targeted therapies and next generation sequencing is really lung cancer. In lung cancer, we've been able to learn every now and then there's a new drug like to the point that usually our pharmacist reminds us and it's like, oh, did you hear that this new exon mutation was found and there's a new drug that got approved? I'm like, I have no idea. But <clears throat> the, the amount of knowledge that we've been getting on mutations from lung cancer is really outstanding. To the point that now 21% of the advanced lung cancers have genomic alterations that will have an FDA approved drug. Now what's the difference here? If you were to look at immunotherapy compared to those targeted agents, the immunotherapy is suboptimal on patients with target mutations. Very different to what happens in melanoma, where melanoma and in colon cancer, I'm gonna show you in a second in colon cancer, and in immunotherapy here, even if the patient has super high expression of pdl one not good. Worse than that, if I actually take a patient and I give them that targeted agent after the immunotherapy, I'm probably gonna harm them. Because the incidence of toxicities, which Marisol is gonna talk about us in a second, of um, immunotherapy, after getting it and then getting the targeted agent, increase radically. So we're not only not creating benefit, but we could create harm. And you see it with all the different type of mutations, and I'm showing here, with BRAF V600E, which has a, a, a targeted therapy approved, this is the waterfall plots, and you see how targeting that specific point mutation, it's amazing for lung cancer, with a very poor response if you were to give those patients immunotherapy, and then, um, unfortunately, when you look at colon cancer, it's completely the opposite. If I give the patients BRAF alone, it will not work. I will need to give a doublet, and even on the front line, it may not be better than what happened on Keynote 177, where the patients got much more benefit from immunotherapy, even if they were BRAF mutant. So, right patient, right drug, right timing. And that's the reason that a lot of the molecular boards, when we, when we have sometimes with our pathologist molecular tumor boards, and they are discussing like, oh, this mutation does this, this is a driver, I'm like, nah, think again. I don't believe that that's the case, because they end up behaving even on the level that they interact even with the other biologics. And look at this, when, the, when there's a BRAF mutation and you block the upstream uh, cetuximab, you harm the patients. Look at that. So when there is an upstream mutation of the microsatellite instability, the patients will have a lower survival if you give them an upstream blocker, probably because you upregulate, remember again the subway from, from Tokyo, that if you will give them an anti-angiogenic where you're not touching that pathway. And 
that's been seen even on the adjuvant setting that maybe the anti-angiogenic might work better. Why? Because there could be some stromal effect of the other drugs that could end up creating pathways behaving different because of the anti-angiogenic on the pericytes and just working around the cells and not directly with the cell. Okay? So that's kind of like where we are. Let's go back to the WENT pathway in the, into all the next generation sequencing. If we think about looking at the next generation sequencing as a tumor development and why are we seeing that, it probably ends up going back to cell of origin. And it could be that a lot of the cells of origin of colorectal cancer are much more on the ones that are really on the base of the, of the gland than the ones that are much closer to the top of the mucosa, which end up having much more different alterations. But at the end, what you end up seeing is that there's a lot of different genomic profiles in colorectal cancer that when several groups, this is just a bunch of different groups, started sequencing colorectal cancer in, as part of that Tumor Cancer Genome Atlas project, they end up getting these different profiles. And you could see that they kind of like almost overlap. So they were kind enough to say, let's get all our data together and create something. And they created what is called the consensus molecular subgroup. And in the consensus molecular subgroup, they realized that there's four different subtypes of colorectal cancer that behave very different. Bear in mind, this was done just in an effort to predict behavior. We did not have any predictive uh, tools for treatment yet. We're looking a little bit more, but this thing that was done at that time by the consensus molecular subgroup was purely on an effort to try to divide the different types of colorectal cancer based, based on genomic expression so that we could do better stratification in subsequent clinical trials, which is what is just happening now. And we're trying to figure it out. And what they found is that they have a type of tumors that are microsatellite instable and then chromosomal stable, uh, instable, which are the ones that you see below. And the um, genetic pathways is completely different that to the point that they almost you could divide the CMS1 into the MSI and then the CIN all the way the CMS2, uh, 3 and 4. Um, and the type of tumors are very different. The reason that we're seeing some tumors in different settings is because you could have a little bit more of the CMS1, 2 or 3. You're going to have different pathways that we're going to target, like the, tr the, the CMS3 is the typical one that has KRAS mutations, and um, the CMS1 is the one that we typically will call immune, but that will mostly benefit from immunotherapies. They tend to have also some BRAF mutations, meaning similar to what I was just showing you, that they could respond quite a bit to immunotherapy. And even though that two of them could look very similar for, from the pathology point of view, because they tend to have some lymphocytic infiltration, the pathway in which that lymphocytic infiltration is completely different, making one immunogenic and the other one inflamed. The inflamed might respond, we're doing some, some uh, data collection, to uh, tumor growth factor inhibition, while the highly immunogenic will respond to immunotherapy because of the PDL1 interaction. But under the microscope, both of them have all this bunch of T cells and B cells around them, and one of them is interacting, the other one is not. The frequency of them is being also looked into some of the prospective clinical studies. You can see that this is kind of like looking at the different uh, alterations. And when you look at them in between right versus left, because you know that there's different expressions, uh, you will see that they could differ. They do not behave different clinically because of finding earlier cancers on the right and earlier cancers uh, than later cancers um, on the left because they could obstruct earlier. That's not the case. That would be, have been a lead time bias. Not the case. The second thing is that also uh, when you look at stage by stage, how they behave right versus left because of this tumor expression, again, that's what the model was trying to do to validate that behavior. You could see that right and left colorectal cancers behave very different regardless if they're on the same stage. So a 3A right still behaves worse than a 3A left, and that's the same is predicted for the other ones. And you don't even get differences in the number of patients that we find in stages one, two, and uh, three, and four. They appear to be kind of like equal. The other thing that we have looked is if maybe this could have been what we call a time or evolution bias, meaning 
Could it have been that we started to find more tumors earlier or later because we started doing better colonoscopies, much more reaching into the cecum? Not the case. You see that in between the periods that, the, that uh, Deb Schrag divided at this time. That was 2000 to 2012, and then all the different 2003, 2004, 2008. No difference. And the second one is like, did we develop better drugs that will treat better right versus left tumors? And that's the reason that we have a different in the in the type of behavior, because like for instance, in between 2000 and 2003 is when we develop oxaliplatin and irinotecan, 2004 to 2008, um, bevacizumab and cetuximab, 2009, KRAS mutation comes into play and better use of cetuximab, exactly the same and exactly the same type of difference in between right and left tumors, more or less at around five to seven month difference in survival just based on that genetic expression. So that's the reason that the sideness, and you can see how it divides, that molecularly will behave differently. So you have a CMS2 that is not that prevalent on the right and much more prevalent on the left, and a CMS1 more prevalent on the right and less prevalent on the left. How do we take this into our next generation sequencing, into our clinics to say, let's take it now prospective, because again, all these databases were done on the non-prospective basis. How you take it is that we have seen that you can have a better addition of uh, bevacizumab for some of those CMS 2 and 3. That's difficult to predict, but much more important is that we're finding that the CMS 4 may have a limited benefit of oxaliplatin. And we're getting some of the genetic companies and next generation sequencing are already telling us this patient may benefit more from next generation sequencing, probably based on this. That's their secret, the, the coronal secret formula, so we don't know how they come with that, but they report to us may benefit more from oxaliplatin-based therapy in colorectal cancer. What's the problem? The problem is that that will be beautiful if the tumor will be just one. But if I tell anyone here, take a picture of your face and take your face as just a whole, we've got eyes, we've got nose, we've got mouth, the same way the tumors have different pieces in the, in the tumor that behave different. The tumors are not homogeneous. And anyone that has been into any of our tumor conferences and look at those gross pathology reports, just even with the naked eye, you don't need a microscope to say that the tumor looks very red here, a little bit more pale here, a little bit kind of like bloody here. That tumor is not homogeneous. That heterogeneity of the tumor exists that you can find very much no correlation of one side of the tumor to the other one. This is a, this is a New England Journal article in which they actually biopsy nine pieces uh, of the same tumor and the uh, correlation of the mutations was extremely poor. So that takes us to, can we even look at that from the gland level? Even on the gland level, in the colon, it does not correlate. So can we do better by getting cell-free DNA that may be circulating from shedding of the tumor of what is active in the tumor and getting that heterogeneity much more to the driver mutation again? And that's where liquid biopsies come into play. And cell-free DNA, essentially, it's also not homogeneous because you can see that there are some tumors that shed a lot of cell-free DNA and some tumors that do not shell, uh, um, shed a lot of DNA, like gliomas are very poor. But that doesn't mean that we cannot do an LP and do cell-free DNA, probably. We have not done it because we just don't pay too much attention and it's easier to get a blood sample, but you could perfectly get cerebrospinal fluid and get cell-free DNA. And at the end, it's purely that. It's just fragments of DNA that are different from the normal DNA of the person. But this is finding a needle on a haystack because every single cell in our body is shedding DNA and we need to find out what mutations are really tumor related and looking at those points is the other coronal secret formula. The clinical applications go all over. The, the clinical applications go from diagnosis and even, even early diagnosis all the way to monitoring, but also early treatment and decision making if you can take a patient and not treat them later on. And the genomic sequencing goes even to the point of maybe looking at, um, I would say, even risk assessment on patients that have not developed cancer. But also uh, to be able to really get the whole story on the body it's quite important because the patient could have a tumor in the lung that differs from the tumor in the liver. And then also post-operative residual for what we call minimal residual disease, it's been 
already in our clinics and we're looking at the circulating tumor DNA negative or positive after the patients have curative intense surgery and I don't think that I need to convince you that those curves look, neg look, look different if the patient is positive or negative. Can we interfere with this? I don't know. Because the question is, if I take a patient like this, should it be that if the patient is positive, I definitely should give them chemo, and if they're negative, I could really spare them from chemo completely? Maybe the ones that I could spare from chemo, yes. The ones that I can definitely give chemo, am I affecting that? We don't know. We're actually doing a lot of the studies. There's one that was just recently reported, the COBRA study, but we're looking at all this. But look at the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value of a positive test and a negative test. It doesn't get any better than this. And that's actually part of the reason of the, of the um, looking at DNA as monitoring of minimal residual disease. Now, what happens if we try to look up as monitoring of the disease as it evolves, since most of our patients are not cured by surgery, but we get them in our clinic for the long term, can we have genetic changes in expression? Because you could have two things that look, or two people that look extremely similar, and they couldn't be more different, uh, like here in Yasser Arafat and Ringo Starr, and seeing could they have a different uh, genetic expression. And they do. Because a synchronous tumor and a metachronous tumor could have a completely different um, genomic profile. And why? Because we're putting receptors under stress. And then even as we put them with chemotherapy, we are changing and getting some discordance in between the tumors. But also the tumors that will end up finding home in another part of the body could have a different type of genomic profile. As you can see, that brain and bone are very discordant to what lung is. And even, I'm not even touching, I could give a full lecture of epigenetics. Can we change even just with diet some of the, of the genetic expression? And we could definitely talk about that. What we know for certain is that we change with our treatments. And like, for instance, if I put the EGFR receptor under stress with an EGFR inhibitor like cetuximab, you are going to be getting some new mutations. And to show you an example of how that works, this is a patient of ours, and you can see that there were quite a bit of progression over time. And these type of tumors, as they were growing, we were mapping them. And look at this profile of this patient with the the color, I think I'm trying to, the KRAS, the, the, the bottom one that is like purple, how it was completely negative, and then it appears, I think it's this one here, I'm a little bit blind, but you can see it there. But as the patient was treated with an EGFR inhibitor, which is, which is ex essentially what I'm showing you here. So the, the patient's treatment history relating to this genomic profile, when this mutation that you see here, KRAS, not detected, not detected, not detected, and then all of a sudden, all the way high, because we put the receptor under stress. So that monitoring of the patient and knowing that you could change the treatment quite fast is what you will end up trying to do with the patients. And this patient had a very long survival uh, curve, but at the end of the day, getting drugs that we can target there and we can do this type of monitoring all the time is what it will be ideal. Now, the future is limitless because if you look and this is taken from the New England Journal of Medicine that they see that the future of this is that we could even get on the genomic profile, even the, that some protocols are asking for UGT mutations to see if the patient may have more toxicity from irinotecan. Maybe that we can also get from the, from the plasma and just get tumor, patient genomic, germinal, all the different things, and be able to really get a much more consolidated uh, treatment plan in which we really get to the point of going into this approach of getting completely all the way into action, not forgetting that all the genomic alterations need to be taken first into consideration with the patient and the comorbidities and all the different things. So this is not just to be taken on isolation. So with that, this is the knowledge uh, curves, and I think that this is kind of like the way that we usually go, that we go from like, what? And I know everything. I think that I'm probably, I'm, I'm probably at this point, where it says, it doesn't show well the, the arrow, let me see, but I'm probably where it says like, I'm never gonna understand this to maybe starting to make sense. And kind of like on that part of the curve. And then back to what Herbert said, all this knowledge is meaningless without action. So if we know that the patient has all this and I am not able to take any action as it happens in 91% of the patients, it's completely meaningless. And with that, this is kind of like when my kids ask me, like, what are little girls made of? 
and they hoped that I would have said sugar and spice. So I'll be more than glad to take any questions. If not, I stole five minutes out of Marisol time that she's probably very grateful. But thank you very much. No questions. You see, I, either I truly convince you or confuse you. Oh, yeah, yeah. My practice is that I retest when I am about to, when I'm looking clinically at the patient that it's having the look that it's progressing and I'm having to think of my next option. So I usually retest as I'm moving forward to the next treatment round so I know what my profile is. Is it the right one? I don't know because you could also say maybe I should be retesting earlier not to be exposing the patient to drugs that are not benefiting him at that time because probably when the patient starts to look declining, it means that I probably have given one or two cycles that are already not working. So I don't know. I, I retest back to what I said when I'm going to take action. And I'm not ready to take action based only on genomic profile change. The same way that I don't know what to do if I retest a patient after I gave adjuvant chemotherapy for, circula for, for colon cancer and I still find a positive circulating DNA. I'm like, okay, now I'm in trouble. But, but I do take action because the, because the action that I take is that I say, let's do the following. Instead of doing scans every six months, I will do the scans every three months because what is going to cure that patient is a new metastasectomy. So I'm waiting for that shoot to drop, find that liver lesion, out of there and hoping that that makes me again a negative circulating tumor DNA assay. So do I have proof of that? No, I'm just doing it because that's my analysis and half of the room may say I'm an idiot, but that's okay. I'm, it's not completely understood when to test. Yep. Good. Thank you.